and we're live and it's like nothing has changed. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the Rooted Vermont first ever water cooler series presented by Untapped. Uh, we of course follow mullet protocol here at Rooted Vermont where we celebrate the folks who are hard charging at the front of the Peloton and we especially celebrate those who are at the back enjoying the party. That is what mullet, mullet protocol is all about. Sounds like a fun office party, and here we are chilling by the cooler. So I'm excited to introduce two friends of mine, two incredible athletes, and one power couple. I presume everyone in the world of OCR knows the two of you, Ryan and Lindsay Atkins. We've invited uh, the two of you to, to taste our neck of the woods, to taste gravel here in Vermont. So hopefully we'll be seeing you on August 1st. Now, when I describe the two of you to friends outside of the OCR world, I say that you guys are the hands down most powerful power couple in sports, your unteenth time world toughest mutters, or specifically, Lindsay Webster Atkins. You are someone who first started obstacle course racing in 2014, I believe. Uh, 2014 Spartan World Championships were held in Killington, Vermont, right down the road here. You became a full-time pro in 2016. 2017 and 2018, you were already a Spartan World Champion. 2015, 16, 17, 18, and 19, an OCR World Champion. You won Spartan U.S. National Series each year since its commencement. Recently, you've started competing in trail running and sky running with a great deal of success. You took first place at the Broken Arrow Sky Race in the U.S., which is the U.S. Sky Running Championship Race. How am I doing so far? Good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thrilled it. to be representing Canada at, in your home country, which brings us to Ryan Atkins, husband to Lindsay Webster Atkins. He is a decent athlete in his own right. I want to say five or maybe six time world's toughest mutter, OCR world champion. I first met Ryan when I got roped into the James Bay descent. That was the almost 400 mile uh, self-supported bikepacking trip going south along the James Bay in Canada in February. More entertaining in Ryan's diversification in athletic endeavors. There was a time, for example, that you were the undisputed world champion in unicycle trials. You have a terrific Instagram video series, which, which I'm going to call, Can I Do a Pull-Up With This? <laughs> Where you take random household objects and see if they can withstand a pull-up. Ryan, what is the best item to date with which you've been able to successfully do a pull-up? Um, he suggested the cat last week. <laughs> 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 I think I think Small. the best the best item that like succeeded where I thought it would fail was the roll of paper towel. Yes. I I really didn't think I thought it would just tear in my hands and it worked. Um yeah. It's amazing. Amazing. So okay, that was a nice long-winded introduction. Let's set the scene real quick. Where are the two of you today? Oh. We are at home in Sutton, Quebec, which is uh about eight miles from the Vermont border. So just mm -hmm. uh, about a hundred miles north of where Ted is. Nice. Well, we are here of course to talk about nutrition, but first I would like you to explain what it means to be an OCR athlete. Are you, are you actually the world's strongest man or woman? Are you toughest mutters? Are you jack of all trades? Tell me about the sport of OCR. Strongest. <laughs> I can tell you that much. <laughs> I, I think to people who aren't well versed in OCR, it's kind of like um, a marriage between kind of like CrossFit and trail running. So it's like you need to be fast and you need to be good at running uh, in all kinds of terrain. And a lot of the races we do are in the mountains or even off trail, like bushwhacking sections, up creeks, up riverbeds, all sorts of terrain. But then as we go along, you'll encounter some kind of obstacle. Could be a wall you have to jump over. Could be a sandbag you have to pick up and run a loop with. It could be something you have to hoist upwards. So um, these are interspersed at kind of random intervals during the race. And you just have to do them as you, as you run along. So it's, uh, yeah, I guess the ideal OCR athlete is someone who has that mixture of strength and um, endurance 
And I would definitely not say that we are the strongest <laughs> and I would not say that we're the fastest, but I think that when you kind of combine the two that we do. Okay. Yeah. We're right on. A lot of people call us like hybrid athletes or like, yeah, yeah cyborgs. <laughs> <laughs> Is uh, how would you, if, if you're trying to give a specific number to it, do you consider yourself each 50, 50? Are you a little bit more endurance, a little bit less strength? How do you, how do you mash up the two? Yeah. Or just a cyborg and it sort of depends on the day. I think you have to like, yeah, a little bit more endurance, I would say. But then you have to have like good enough upper body strength and natural, yeah, just like a capabilities in order to yeah. do the obstacles. So a lot of cross-country skiers or like rowers, like athletes who are like, it's like an endurance-based sport, but they also have to do a lot of upper body type. Right. That they tend to do really well in obstacle racing. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. I mean, I like all the the part about going, like you said, you're going to do circuits through the woods, which you pick and choose your words there. And it almost sounds like a gravel race. So we are lucky enough to be able to pick the brains of these two multi-time world champions. Um, We are, of course, talking about nutrition. I'm hoping that you can shed some light onto your food and nutrition philosophies of your household. What do you guys look at the the bigger picture of food and nutrition in, in the Atkins household? Well, um, Lindsay is an awesome chef and uh, a wizard of the kitchen, and uh-huh. so she prepares. She's good too. Though. She prepares a lot of our dinners, but um, I'd say that we eat like a very normal diet. It's very, uh, I'd say, heavy on uh, vegetables. Um, pretty much every night we have a salad. Um, tonight, for instance, we had uh, it was like a coconut rice with um, some chicken in there and some asparagus and then a big salad. So um, I'd say there's nothing like that extraordinary about our diet, but it's all um, it's all like normal foods that you can just buy uh, at a grocery store, nothing that's kind of prepared or canned or things like that. Um, and we then, do like chocolate, though. <laughs> like chocolate. Yeah. I've decided that anybody who says they don't like chocolate is actually lying. Yeah. With all due respect to anybody who actually doesn't like chocolate, but it just seems so outlandish. It's like saying you don't like maple syrup. It's just, yeah. it's not true. Yeah. It's like they've convinced themselves that they just haven't like eaten chocolate recently enough to realize how good it is. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd say we, um, I think we eat yeah, everything in moderation. We eat everything. We don't have any food allergies, so we don't like stay away from anything that like gives us up to tummies. But um, yeah, we eat, like basically the way I think of it is like everyone kind of knows the way they should eat. And mm-hmm. then there's always like something, some external factor that like comes along and tells you like to eat a different way, whether it's maybe you go to a fast food joint and there's like an epic looking burger there and you're like, Hmm, I, I want to eat that because it looks good. Or like maybe you see some kind of report about a new fad diet that you only eat like, I don't know, sweet potatoes. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's all you eat. And like, that's like, you're like, oh yeah, if I do that, I'm going to become infinitely faster and better. But it's, I think for us, our philosophy for diet is like real foods and like get a bit of everything all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of worked for us well. I do think we've gone through phases where we've tried like cutting things out. Like for a while we tried dairy and a lot of athletes are gluten free. Ted, you probably know, mm-hmm. um, they say that gluten causes inflammation. So like mm-hmm. just as an athlete, just stay away from anything that causes inflammation, you recover faster. And so we tried to cut out gluten for a while and I just, I don't know, like, I don't think we felt any different and it was pain in the butt and it was like mentally a bit stressful. <laughs> so yeah. I to use that energy towards training or something. If I, if it's not actually helping me sleep better or like, recover or perform better right yeah 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 i feel i feel identically i feel like i've tried a handful of fads i mean whatever they are right i mean i've tried going gluten-free i've tried a whole series of things and at the end of the day i haven't had one takeaway that i said boom this works outside of just eat a whole foods real foods wholesome nutrition diet so i'm right there with you uh i see a question tick in which is right on topic when you start training for a specific event, how does your nutrition evolve as your training evolves? So 
let's take one step back before you answer that. In a normal year, how many days per year are you competing? Well, it used to be more. We used to compete around 35 wow. races two weeks a year. And like some events are like two races in a weekend and some are just single. So mm -hmm. it'd be like a race every two weeks or something. Um, mm -hmm. And that number has kind of dropped to, I think, somewhere between like 18 and 23 races a year yeah. uh, would be like pretty typical. Uh, I think last year was exceptionally low. <laughs> yeah. sure so you still got you still got some good events in there so then yeah. taking those numbers do you see do you see a cycle over the course of a calendar year as your nutrition evolves do you do you celebrate you know christmas with not much competition by eating cake every day or or like how do you focus specifically on training and nutrition i think that Lindsay probably like makes more of a change in her diet over like the holidays where she like yeah. likes to really enjoy herself. Well, cause I love baking and, and <laughs> yes. like during our race season, my like, secret when talent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. when it's competitive race season, I'll try and avoid baking. Like, we shouldn't be eating. Like we still eat dessert pretty much every night. But like if I make a whole, whatever batch of cookies, like we're going to eat them because we're the only two people in the house. And it's just mm -hmm. like, not what we need during race season we could be substituting those calories with something like sweet potatoes or something yeah healthier yeah <laughs> so when the holidays roll around and we're done racing i'm just like okay it's like time to bake i i think <laughs> to myself that when i'm like really focused on a big event um that my nutrition just like gets a little bit more fine-tuned like maybe a little just more specific and more like attention paid to it but i i would say it it changes very minimally and like mm -hmm. i usually train a similar volume year round um it doesn't fluctuate like massively so what works for me in like a off season when i'm just like training for fun and when i'm like actually preparing with more intensity for like uh, a big event or something like that it it kind of all works pretty well for me um mm -hmm. i think if i'm doing like a massive amount of volume i need to like <clears throat> it's just all about calories at that point and that then it shifts towards just like getting in whatever you can but um mm -hmm. i also find that's unsustainable for like a long time so right so here's a i stay apprised to what you're doing in training especially when it's highly entertaining much like uh can i do a pull-up with this activity <laughs> And I was inspired recently, although I didn't actually do anything about it. And many people were inspired by your, call it seven summits, where for one week straight, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you summited, whether it be on bike or on foot or on treadmill, the, the, the elevation of the highest peaks on the planet, the seven highest peaks, one per uh, continent, obviously. My question is meant to be specific. So obviously that's going to be a massive week. Like what kind of hours of volume did he do that week? That week was 56 hours. <laughs> I was and I was just the support crew. I was like exhausted. And that that's moving time. So I, I was out probably quite a bit longer. Cause... That was a calorie dump. I had baked like 15 batches of cookies. And like after a yeah. while, I like couldn't keep up with like the amount of like support that I had to do and the amount of baking. So I just started buying more. <laughs> that is that's an example of when he just eats like whatever yeah and you ate mac and cheese for dinner one night i had mac and cheese and hot dogs because it was just like uh -huh. i stopped i was eating i was getting really like food fatigued where i was just like i didn't want to eat anything because i was uh -huh. just so tired of eating uh -huh. and uh <laughs> so I, nice. yeah, I just i was like just trying to think of like whatever could appeal to me because i was just like trying to take in as much as I that is, yeah, I guess thinking of the logistics of it, I mean, I, I pay attention from across a computer screen and it's fascinating. And then hearing the actual logistics of it is a bit mind bending. <laughs> um, what over the course of that week before you had food fatigue, what were the things that you were looking forward to in terms of nutrition, in terms of food, in terms of um, refueling? Yeah, basically every day I was... Uh, Lindsay was baking a ton of cookies and, mm -hmm. um, I was eating those. I would take like a, 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 
about 500 milliliters of maple syrup with me every day and mm -hmm. drink that. Um, and then I would have uh, like candies. There's like this giant tub of candies you can buy in Quebec. Yeah. And it's like $10 for like two or three kilos of like these tasty candies. <laughs> And oh, so, so I was just like plowing those and, um, and egg then salad. like, like egg salad sandwiches salad. were good, peanut butter and jelly, um, those kinds of things. But yeah. Have you ever, have you ever suffered from gastro issues from gut rot from, uh, you know, bad stomach at all over the course of your career? And this is a question for either of you. Like, have mm -hmm. you ever had to train the kind of nutrition that you're taking down? Um, for myself, like I've done a lot of 24 hour running races and those are really hard on the gut because it basically turns into like a food eating competition. Yeah. Um, cause after about eight to 13 hours in, it's like, if you haven't stayed on top of your food intake, like you're just, you, your pace just drops like crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I've kind of had to like train what I can tolerate for those types of events and but i think it's different for everybody yeah i think it's different for everybody like I, yeah the usual stuff for me like like i said before maple syrup or um pedialyte works well for me and then like ginger candies kind of like help my stomach stay like normal um heck yeah yeah, yeah that was the genesis of ginger maple aid yeah we hear people who are complaining about gut rot yeah, any sort of gastro issue and, and ginger is this naturally soothing effect. It's like super bad when you're like running, especially too. And we did this four day stage race this year and I was drinking ginger maple leaf like nonstop the whole, like every day. The race. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, but I told Lynn this funny story, our friend Lynn who lives down the road. Um, she's a cyclist, Lynn Bissett. Some people might know her, but yeah. Um, yeah, she's a badass. But I was telling her how Ryan's first like 24 hour mountain bike race, he didn't know what to eat. And you oh, asked yeah. some guy and this guy was like, just buy like no. one gel, one goo for every my half mom, hour. My mom asked him. Oh, <laughs> I was like 17 years old or something. And I was doing a 24 hour mountain bike race. I don't know why I thought of this the other day. But and I just like told our trailer him. or like we had like a little tent trailer and it was like parked beside this other guy who was yeah. like, the, like this like wily veteran guy and my mom was like chatting with him because she's like super chatty and she was like oh so like what's what is your what are you gonna eat and he's like well i have like and he had like 48 gels he just had like oh <laughs> and, he, one and he was like i just take one every half hour and like that's what oh. i do so my mom was mm -hmm. like oh no we don't have like we only have like five gels so she went and bought like Gels. She went and bought like a ton. <laughs> feeding me these gels, and mm -hmm. after like seven or eight hours, I was like, "Do not give me another gel." Does it felt yeah. like a ball of like gel just like in my stomach, and it was like <laughs> sitting there, and it just like wouldn't like. Oh, and then like, he told right. me to go buy you chili from Tim Hortons. Oh yeah, I forget what it was. It and was then like, we had like um, canned chili, and I was like eating that. that was, right, it's the gravitation towards real food. I mean, once you. Yeah. <laughs> flavor fatigue is real and once that sets in yeah. you're like i can't fathom eating something else but yeah. some people are fine like that guy obviously is fine to eat gels for 24 hours and like yeah. Yeah. people who are like lynn replied to this story by telling me that she did a 12-hour race and she just drank maple syrup gels and yep. water for like 12 hours and she was like i was flying and i was like i would get so hungry because i eat things like i'll i'll eat basically like maple syrup and pedialyte and uh -huh. like, like rice like cooked rice but i need like rice something that's actually real yeah. food um, find if the event's longer than like five or six hours that like having at least like one like real food item really helps like kind of get some like substance into you, yeah. you know sure I mean? yeah so yeah pivoting off that like much like gravel racing the distances and times can be all over the map. You can do a, a one hour gravel race. You can do a multi-day gravel race. I think OCR can be in a very similar scope. What does your nutrition plan look like sort of diving into specifics? Are you able to carry food with you? Are there feed zones? Are you designated spots that you've dropped your own food? How does that sort of thing work? You know, yeah. so most of the races we do that are a bit shorter, there's uh, like water stations. Mm-hmm. 
and you just run by and like grab a cup of water and drink it. And so you only have access to that and it's only ever water. So like, you don't have like a fanny pack. I think you so, need to yeah, introduce the fanny pack. Like near a fanny pack, but it's also really annoying <laughs> to have like more than like about a half a liter of like drink mix. Sure. 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 Pack, Cause it just like, when it's full, it just bounces along and like smacks you in the butt the whole time. So, uh, <laughs> I like the running vest, it's like you wear, like it's like a little vest that you wear, and it fits. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But I'll, yeah, we usually bring food if it's like I don't know more than what three hours. I would say that we're we bring like yeah, and for races, and even for like an hour long race, I'll bring like a gel or something. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. on. So. Ryan, we talked about just a second ago when you were 17, you did your first 24 hour race. Question for both of you Have you ever done gravel races before? No. Never. I'm really excited. I'm really nice. excited. Nice. What this far out, what are we? It's, it's at late March, so we're probably, what, four months out? I'm not doing the math real quick. What do you suppose, what are you forecasting for your fueling strategy? How was I? Did I get that right, Ryan? Five months out? Four months out? April, yeah. May, June. July, August, four months, four days. Uh, yeah. How, like, what do you anticipate your fueling strategy would be? Is it the kind of thing that you're consciously thinking about beforehand? Do you sort of wing it at the last minute? What, what do you suppose you're going to be is on your mind? For that length of event, like I'll probably have like, I don't know, maple gels and like a, two cookies or something like mm -hmm. that would be like all that I need. I really like if I'm doing, if I'm going like, harder but i'm going like for a long time i like doing like a mixture of like a pretty high carbohydrate like drink mix something around like 300 calories or more in a bottle and then mm -hmm. like taking maple gels on top of that mm -hmm. so like i would probably just like however many hours i think it's going to take me i would just have that mm -hmm. and right on well yeah things to think about we have the heat of the summer, August 1st, as you know, this neck of the woods, the humidity can be pretty fierce. So <laughs> you will be pleased to know we have at least three aid stations for the long course. I want to say at least two for the short course um, where, you know, you can zoom by. I mean, imagine it's similar to an OCR race where you can zoom by and pick stuff up, obviously, naturally supported by untapped. Um, but more hydration, I mean, things that I'm thinking about, and I assume things that you're thinking about more hydration, more maple aid, more electrolytes, just, just staying on top of those sorts of intake before you get too deeply dehydrated. Mm -hmm. Um, have, have you, either of you ever really suffered with cramps at all, or, or is that something you've sort of never had to deal with? Uh, I have like once I have like had cramps, but I wouldn't say I'm like prone to cramping. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I think if I like go way beyond anything I've done in like training for a while and like for a long time, then like it's inevitable. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Shoot. You did a race in Iceland that was absurdly long. What was yeah. the distance of, or I think I know it, but remind me. Yeah. That was a 24 hour race. So I think I ran 85 miles there <laughs> and it was, uh, it was pretty miserable. I don't know if anybody's been to Iceland in December who's on this call, but it's, <laughs> I don't recommend vacationing there in December. Everybody it's... says they love Iceland. And I was like, <laughs> Iceland is the only trip I've ever been on that I was like, take me home. No. Uh, <laughs> and this is, folks, don't forget, we're talking to two pretty hardened Canadians <laughs> who know a thing or two about bad weather. Yeah. You could have Like, you literally, like, the wind was so strong that you can't run. You definitely can't run. Yeah. You couldn't yeah. train. You can barely like walk or stand. Luckily, the day of Ryan's race was like the quiet day. Yeah, the wind was only like was, 20, so. 20 or 5 miles an hour that day. Yeah, so it was bearable, but then there was. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. It was blowing 25 miles an hour today, and I felt like I was in a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, we're, we're obviously preaching some virtues in maple syrup. One, folks, maple syrup doesn't freeze, so please bring it to your cold weather events. Now, Speaking to a couple of Canadians and preaching those virtues of maple syrup, why do you suppose you have talked about it being a, a product that you're using often? Why do you suppose it works well for you? Mm, I think for me, because it, I don't know, it's natural sugars. Like one thing I discovered 
through a lot of racing, especially the longer ones, is that if I use something like shot blocks or goose, which like shot blocks are delicious, I'm not fully against them. But if the race is longer mm-hmm. than four hours, then like I'll start having gut issues. And like Ryan said earlier, it kind of feels like it's like sitting in your stomach in a giant block. Um, yeah. So I think it, just with like natural sugar, is it? It works better. It you. works better. I don't get stomach cramps. Um, I think for me, yeah. it's like, it's so delicious. So it like, <laughs> so I mean, it's kind of obvious, but like every time you drink, you drink one, take one, eat one. Um, yeah. It's like just that, oh, it's so good. And I but, always want something with caffeine, like three quarters of the way through my event, whatever the length is. So like the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Well, and, that was a question I was about to ask. Where does caffeine fit into your nutrition lineup uh i mean Lindsay, you just hit it on the head for you you're having something later in the race is it for the caffeine boost is it for the flavor is it for a placebo effect what do you what do you suppose you like caffeine for i don't know i i think like i want to feel awake and like recharged and like at some point especially in really long events you kind of start to feel like the bonk a little bit you start to feel a little out of it um, but the thing is, if you if it's a long event and you start taking it too early, you basically have to like keep taking it. Yeah. Dehydrated. So like my plan of action is always to sort of take it like start taking it three quarters of the way through, and that's something to like really look forward to. I think mm-hmm. the thing with caffeine is I really like the like how there's like coffee caffeine in the uh, untapped gels because I find that like if you take a synthetic caffeine, it's like really like the effect is really aggressive. Mm-hmm. Like it like takes you from here to like here and then it like you drop back down afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like couldn't nat- agree more. It's more like, it's more of like a kind of a gentle effect and we both drink coffee. So I think we're like, we're used to it. And so like, mm-hmm. but I think the other thing that people don't maybe think of is like with caffeine, it keeps you, like more mentally alert and like yeah. making those right decisions or like missing those potholes on the bike or like maybe making the, you know, the right move at the right moment and not just being like often, you know, daydreaming as you're riding along there. So that's what I meant to say. See, he's good at explaining. There's it. like a, a <laughs> mental, <laughs> mental acuity um, that having that caffeine and having like, I think they're 25 milligrams um, in the, in the coffee untapped. Which like and, a cup of coffee is like a hundred or yeah. 75 or something. So it's like, it's not yeah. a time, it's enough to make you. Yeah. It's enough to like keep you kind of cruising. Yeah. No, that was, you're spot on. I, there's 27 milligrams in the coffee untapped. There's 25 milligrams in the, the lemon tea maple aid. And that was specifically done knowing that you're going to be routinely taking these things on board. And so you don't want a cup of coffee every half hour, every 45 minutes. Um, and yeah, you, you also hit it exactly on the head that there is, there is a different sensation when you have synthetic caffeine, when you have a product and caffeine is one of the ingredient lists or one of the items on the ingredient, it like, it hits you different. Whereas, Mm -hmm. you know, real natural caffeine is it, I don't know. It's like a cup of coffee. It just has you going on a normal set of cylinders. Yeah, I remember in a 24 hour race once taking like a caffeine pill, like just a. Oh boy, how'd that go? Um, Well, I was three quarters (laughs) of the way through the event, like I always do, but like I honestly felt like something was wrong with my heart. Like I thought that I was like, I might die. (laughs) Oh man. Um, I mean, obviously fine, but like. (laughs) Gnarly. Gnarly. (laughs) (laughs) It takes you from here to like way up here. Yeah. So we, uh, as I mentioned, we're celebrating the folks up front, business up front. We want to celebrate the party in the back. So if we're generalizing and we see these as two groups, what nutrition advice do you have for these two different groups and communities? Like what is, what is a mistake that you see top athletes making? For me, for example, I see, I see a lot of hard charging athletes. They're sipping too much water. And I think having a, a carbohydrate and electrolyte drink mm-hmm. in conjunction with water works well. Yeah. And the same, the same type of question. What, what do you see like that a recreational cyclist could really, could really I, benefit from? I think, I, go ahead. 
I think it's like a, a multi-pronged answer here because I think that if you're actually racing like <clears throat> really, really hard for a really long time, then there's not a lot of like real foods that will that you'll be able to take in when you're like pinned like that. So yeah. if you're at the front, like it's it's like you said, it's like carbohydrate heavy drinks, it's like gels, maple syrup gels that work for you, and it's like really staying on top of it because yeah. Um, I've noticed that for myself, it's always like, it's surprising how much you actually need and how much like you can take in and absorb. And a lot of people, I think stick to that. Like uh, they, they just don't take in enough or like, they don't think they can take in too, as much as they can. And that's something you can train too. So if you do it in training, um, like if you practice it in training and you practice what works for you and you practice like how much works for you, then when you hit the race, it's like second nature instead of it being like its own mystery. Yeah. And if you're if you're kind of having more fun at the back and going for like a more enjoyable pace, then I would say like drink the untapped maple syrups, but also like I don't know, have a cookie. Have a cookie or have a PB and J or have a like something that you like have some Oreo cookies or some gummies or th things that like give you energy. But if you're going a little bit easier on the flats or like maybe as you're crossing a hill or something like that, use it to your advantage. Use the fact that you're going a little easier to like have more tasty things when you're out there and yeah. like, really enjoy it. Um, mm -hmm. Which I think is awesome. And I think if you're doing, even if you're in the front, you can still kind of like maybe do that a little bit. If you like time it properly, like maybe when you're cresting a hill before a long descent and you yeah. like sit for a bit, you can manage to have a few b bite bowls of something, yeah. um, something real. We had a nutritionist tell us once, like try and take in 200 calories an hour at least. Um, so we usually do like 100 every 30 minutes. But as a general rule, like whether you're I do. racing, yeah, you more do more. more, you do like 100. <laughs> I do sure. Like two at least, yeah. Um, and if you listen to podcasts, like even, I mean, Kate Courtney has done podcasts for the cyclists out there, like they know who Kate is. And <laughs> he has talked about doing long rides. Like she'll start, when she does a long ride day, she'll start fueling 20 minutes into her ride, which like she's not even hungry yet. But she's sure. already going to take fuel. So like to me, it's just... Yeah, it's mind-boggling, like, how much people underfuel. Um, so I think that 200 calories an hour rule is, like, a pretty good one to live yeah. up. Just, yeah, take something every 30 minutes an hour and stay on top of it. And, like, try it in training, and you'll notice how much better, like, you feel, how much faster you recover, how much better your sessions go. Yeah. Okay. I, actually, I actually have, um, like, the Super Sapiens glucose monitor, which mm -hmm. I've kind of been playing around with a bit. And it's really interesting because it'll show you where your glucose levels are doing like in real time. And one thing that I noticed is that like when I get behind on like long rides and my glucose level starts dropping, I, sometimes I'll take in like, like five, 600 calories before it like starts coming back up. And before I did this, I would, I would be like, what's a serving? A serving is like, a gel so like i would like i would do one and then i would be like oh so like if you're bonking my solution was like to eat and then like one serving and you'd be good but like once you start getting down it takes so much like fuel to like come out of that hole mm -hmm. and so that was really like an eye opener for yeah me. like if you if you feel it if you feel a bonk it's like it's too late and you need to like start pounding like as much as you can handle like right away <laughs> that's that is fascinating especially over the longer events um yeah. yeah so you're saying you're like overly compensate to a to a huge degree in order to dig yeah. yourself out of that hole totally because then yeah. if say you're riding another three hours after that yeah it's like it's like it's two hours from now that you're going to be like still going strong whereas if you just like take one serving when you bond uh -huh. it might like fix you for the next 15 minutes <laughs> 15 or 20 or 30 minutes but then yeah yeah in yeah in place Oh, that's fascinating. Um, so yeah, chiming in my own two cents here. Um, one of the funniest things that happens in the world tour is, you know, we are, we are radioed back to the car 
and people who are watching the bike race, they think they were getting all sorts of interesting tactics in the bike race. Like watch out for this guy. There's an attack going on. The breakaway is this 98% of what's said over the radio is your team director saying, eat and drink. Don't forget to eat and drink, eat and drink, <laughs> eat and drink, eat and drink. And it's, you know, at the highest level, the best people in the world are, are still forgetting to eat and drink and stay on top of their nutrition. And so what, um, is, what would they eat and drink like in a tour race like that? Like, um, I mean, it, it's a lot of the stuff we've been talking about. It's, it, it is a focus on real foods we have for an Italian cycling team, panini. So like little sandwiches, you know, a small yeah. piece of bread with a piece of ham, piece of cheese, little piece of bread. Um, a lot of cookies. Yeah, like manufactured stuff. It's always like, like we have friends in Norway and they bring little yeah. like sandwiches with brown cheese and ham. Like ham. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, when I was racing in Belgium, the Stroop waffles are, are incredibly popular. And that was the advent of why we created a Stroop waffle. I said, these are tasty, but why on earth is there no maple syrup in this waffle? And <laughs> boom, created a maple syrup waffle. Um, and then sort of at the polar opposite side, you know, folks who are new to the sport, I think we've talked about the reservations of eating and saying, oh, my stomach's going to hurt. I can't take the food down. I hope if there are folks out there listening who are new to the sport and worried about taking nutrition, you're hearing us preach time and again, an appreciation for food, a love for food and, and a need for food when you're, when you're going out for these events, even on short training days. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that there's like this kind of notion where like you, you like ride to like burn calories in order to like lose weight. But I feel like you need to, when you're riding, you need to like, you need to maximize your performance and you need to maximize like the effect of what you're getting from your ride. And mm -hmm. like, to perform the next day. yeah and so a way of doing that is to like take in adequate nutrition like your body's still gonna be fired up after you get back from your ride so like your resting metabolic rate is gonna go up you're gonna burn more calories and but like i don't know one of the reasons why we ride or like one of the reasons why people ride is to like get fitter and so mm -hmm. like that's part of it it's like fueling your car so if you don't if you don't feel you won't like reap those benefits. And it also like really crushes your recovery. If like the first six hours of your recovery, you're like coming back from a bonk every time you go training. Yeah. yeah. Like in a tour race, what do they eat when they're, what do you guys eat when you're like done for the day? Is it an eating competition? Basically you're just like shoveling in as much. Food. Yeah. You finish the race. The second you step on the bus, they're giving you a recovery shake. Say, so, you know, protein, carb recovery drink. Um, there will also be a plate of pasta or or rice with some sort of simple protein. Um, that's for the two hour drive back to the hotel. You get a massage, and as you're waiting for a massage, you can go to the the Swanier's room and grab a bowl of cereal or or some fruit. Or there is still probably that rice option. But then another two hours later, you're having another pretty big carbohydrate rich meal. They they are well rounded. You'll have protein, salad, vegetable, um, and I won't say it's grotesque the amount you have to eat, but it is a it is an eating contest as much as anything. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, Lindsay, you hit it on the head with talking about Kate starting her ride 20 minutes in. She's already fueled up pre-ride. She probably had a really good breakfast. Yeah. 20 minutes in, she's fueling. If she's going out for a four, five, six hour ride, like it's it's nearly impossible to consume the calories that in total that she's going to be burning over the day. So you still end up at this at this big deficit. So then to Ryan's point, like by riding your bike and riding your bike a lot, the folks who are purely trying to lose weight, it's inevitably going to happen. So eat to ride, ride to eat. Yeah. So we got some great questions coming in. First and foremost, Lindsay, favorite thing to bake? Cookies or brownies? Like I'm not like a fancy baker person uh -huh. who make croissants and stuff. Lindsay, I'm just like. <laughs> Lindsay makes like the best simple. bread too. Thank you. Yeah, I love making bread as well. Yeah. A quick bread or like a yeasty rising bread or a de rising bread. Yeah. Impressive. <laughs> Ryan, what is your favorite thing to eat that Lindsay bakes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically everything. She's mm -hmm. um, she likes to like kind of perfect recipes. Do. And so uh, they get pretty good. Um, she makes some awesome cookies and like I said, her bread. It's funny, we went to like this local bakery here in town yesterday and got a loaf of their bread. And I was like, oh, this is just not nearly as good as your bread. 
right? I don't know. When I first met him, he was like, do you know Dave's power seed bread? It's like, so you buy from the grocery. He was like, this stuff's so good. And I was like, bleh. And <laughs> you had that at your mom's house the other week. Oh, and he was like, bread's disgusting. And I was like, I thought you loved it. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Full circle. <laughs> um, how about favorite foods or drinks that you guys choose for recovery? Smoothies. We eat smoothies like most days. Yeah. I'd say. Yeah, I do a smoothie, fig smoothie pretty much every day with like granola. granola. Yeah. We also granola have in the smoothie yeah. or granola after it's been smooth. Smoothie. After it's been smooth. We like, yeah, and then we mix and it. And then in. on top. Yeah, you pour okay. it on top and then you like stir it with a spoon. So you Are you it. the kind of person who puts like a salad into your into your smoothie, like kale and broccoli in with your peanut butter and blueberry yeah. cobbler? I just do like berries and like yogurt and um what else do we also do like some peanut butter, things like that. Yeah. We put right. collagen in, which makes your joints feel like really nice and supple. Nice. Like, like you're running a lot. Yeah. So if uh -huh. anything there gets like sore knees and whatever hips or whatever, like try collagen. It's it's pretty yeah. You'll I've heard some very good things. You feel a million million bucks better. Nice. Yeah. How about, do you have any pre-race nutrition strategies that you'd like to stick to night before or morning of, for example? Yeah, well, yeah. night before, it's nothing crazy. I think if we're doing like a big major race, we'll probably have something a little heavier on carbs um, and a little lighter on like everything else. But like, no, we wouldn't have like just a giant plate of noodles or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then morning of, for me, it's pretty much always oatmeal. Um and then I really like taking beet powder, like before I race, mm -hmm. about like an hour before I'll take a scoop of that and coffee and then just go send it. A lot of people ask us about carb loading <laughs> too, which like yeah. I think people don't understand that like to properly carb load, you have to start like four days before and like all you eat is carbs. Well, no, you're supposed to it's, go off carbs and then go back on. Yeah, he knows the science. I don't know. It's pretty complicated. To it's do. really complicated. <laughs> yeah. Like, just yeah. Like, pasta the night before. Like, no, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a whole week long. Well, right. Yeah, it flies in the face of every varsity high school sport. We're like, we got to have a soccer carbo night before our big game tomorrow. And it's like, well, that's good for bonding. And that is important. And carbohydrates right. are important in that diet. But actual carbo loading is a is a far reaching they, thing beyond for, that for tour races do they carbo load because that then it's like important because the race is actually right so well yeah then it just goes back to the point of being anytime you're in a in competition anytime you're at a training camp it's just you're largely eating a 97 percent carb diet anyway that you don't purely say we're having a carb recovery meal right um on the topic of food, because let's just keep talking about food. So let's let's pretend you're in a, a particularly high volume training period. What are your go to items when you are un season, uh, unreasonably hungry outside of meal time? Me, for example, because I'd like to just cut in and tell you what I do. Trader Joe's has peanut butter pretzels, the mm -hmm. little nuggets with the peanut butter in the middle and the pretzel on the outside. But in particular, I have the salt free ones because. Naturally, there's quite a bit of sodium in them. And then you think about how much salt is on the outside when you eat like an entire bag. <laughs> they are magnificent. What are either of your go-to specifics? What are your go-tos? I don't know. Like I'm I'm pretty good with my like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I eat like really big dinners. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm not as much of a snacker as Ryan. But if I had to like pick a snack, I usually, I don't know what I would like. It goes on toast with some yeah, chicken breast. <laughs> if it's like midday, I just like I have like a a series of like snacks that I'll just kind of roll through, like avocado toast, like a like a wrap of some sort. Um, maybe I'll have like another smoothie or just like a bowl of yogurt and granola. Um, oranges, one, apples, bananas. One thing that's really gross things. that we sometimes do is like chocolate. I have, I have like. Polish heritage, <laughs> so my family always had herring in the fridge. Oh, nice! Yeah, so we always Dude. have like herring. <laughs> so yeah, so we just like go there and like vinegary eat, fish, eat, like chickled herring. But it's really good for you, and it's like it's just protein, so it yeah, 
fills you up pretty well. Like, oh, that's terrific. Uh, I think that might make Laura gag, but I, <laughs> my mom always has a, a jar of pickled herring in the fridge, and yeah. yeah, I mean that's what a fork is good for. Yeah. Oh, well, my sister came to visit for Christmas, and she just like drank all the vinegar and like ate all the onions out and left the fish. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh that's magnificent. Um, I, my guess is I know the answer to this. How conscious are you of the ratio of carbs, fats, proteins on a routine basis? Um, you know, okay. So it was like two years ago that I think macros started becoming a big thing that people were talking about. And, um, embarrassingly, I didn't actually know what they were. So, I kept having people ask me like on Instagram, what are your macros like? And after a while I was just like, you know what? I'm going to like figure out what these are and then I'll track my calories for two <laughs> weeks. So I can actually figure out like what I eat in the day. But I'd say for an athlete, it's pretty average. Like I'm somewhere between 15 and 20%. Like I don't really pay attention to it, but it was 15 to 20% protein. I think I don't remember. Like, I don't know. I don't track my macros. <laughs> Mostly carbs, and then the rest was fat. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, like fifty-five percent carbs. I think I think like the thing that makes the most sense to me that the people are saying right now is like finding a protein um, amount of protein based on your body weight, and then doing like your carbs and fat, like a ratio of fats, like to that. And then, like, basically adding in as much carbs as, like, you're training. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you were to have a specific macro, it would, like, change based on, like, every day based on, like, how much you train or how much. But, like, I think the important thing is, like, hitting that, like, right protein number and then, like, having a mix mm -hmm. of everything else. Wicked. Makes I sense. Compared to some cyclists and stuff, I'm, like, Ryan knows the science of a lot of stuff, but you just don't can bother that much really but i don't know i'm like relatively uneducated compared to a lot of athletes out there i'm just like oh you know i eat stuff but yeah. i have talked to a nutritionist before and he was like what well, you don't know these things like Lindsay what? reads books on how to bake cookies not on like how to <laughs> <laughs> how to bake cookies without any good ingredients <laughs> and they're also I mean, going to be and a butter and sugar and yeah there's no point in eating a cookie if it's going to taste like crap <laughs> yeah 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 um have you either of you do anything with cbd do you experiment with it use it love it loathe it experimental no, we use, <laughs> i'd say we use it regularly I recreationally like <laughs> yeah. yeah i find it helps me sleep really a lot better and yeah it's good for like anxiety whereas you use it more for recovery yeah topical okay. pill oil how do you I do oil all the above i do oil and um like a rub if i have like a sore like i i tore i like tore a calf muscle like two weeks ago oh, wow. so I was rubbing it on that a bunch and then pretty much every night i'll take like i think four grams or so um before i go to bed and i find mm -hmm. it just like I sleep well anyways, but I find like I just sleep extra well. So I think sleep is like the only thing that like is actually makes you recover. Like everything else is kind of like, yeah, maybe it works. Yeah, you can put these boots on. Yeah, maybe they'll work. But like to a certain extent, sleep yeah. is like the thing that like is like, okay, you will definitely get better if you sleep. And, and so anything that like improves your sleep is like a big win. And I find that's the case with CBD for me. Nice. Um, I'm looking over my shoulder at the book Good to Go by Christy Ashwanden. Apologies to Christy, whose last name I just butchered. Great book. Good to go. Folks, read it. It is all about basically every recovery modality under the sun. And it's Ryan basically distilled it right there. Like we can think on the every little thing that you want, but it is quite basic. Um, sleep is so powerful. And it's so funny because we live in this hard charging, fast paced society where we're like, I slept for four hours last night. I got so many things done. And I have terrible recovery. And you can figure out why. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. 
Noise, noise. Okay, zeroing in on the end here. Uh, let's see. We are, we are. Our geography brings us to northern Vermont and in southern Quebec. Do you fit much wild game or wild fish into your diets? Mm. Herring. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wish I did more. Um, there's actually a lot of hunting that happens kind of around us, but we don't hunt. Uh, maybe I, maybe I will one day, but. Um, and I wish I fished more, but I think I'm going to do last, last summer, um, Buck Miller, who Ted knows and, uh, Tim Johnson, who Ted also knows. And I, we also, we all went up and did like a bike packing trip, um, in Northern Quebec and we brought our fishing rods and we, we just like, <clears throat> every time we crossed the Creek, we would just like catch a bunch of trout and eat them and then just keep riding. So that was like really awesome and that's something i want to do more of so maybe i'll strap my fishing rod onto my bike more often this summer and go find some some fishing holes yeah that was legendary like a free range or whatever i don't know yeah especially with chicken yeah yeah we have we have chickens on our property so we like get our own eggs from them and so Lindsay does a lot of gardening, so I mean, nice. not quite game, but I mean, it is kind of fairly local. Yeah, I'm with you. I like it. Um, how about beer? Where does beer fit into your nutrition? We love beer. Yeah, we love beer. Uh -huh. um, we we are both actually sponsored by Athletic Brewing, who make a non-alcoholic beer. Uh -huh. Which we enjoy, and we also More enjoy so in race season. We also it's enjoy alcohol beer. <laughs> we drink alcohol. Like we don't discriminate between types of beer. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I love IPAs, and I love stouts, and I love um. Yeah. Porters. Yeah. Porters. And... I think if we're like, if we have a big race coming up, we try and avoid alcohol more. Like I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that we're like, oh, we have to cut it out. Like we're not strict like that. Well, but we would definitely have a lot less. Than we mm -hmm. would, so. Well, that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. One of you had said it early on the show and, and everything in moderation. And that is, that's good advice in so many facets of life, not yeah. least of which here in nutrition um, and in our beer consumption as much as <laughs> All the beer all the time. Sounds like a great plan. Um, well, shoot. Do you have any questions of Rooted Vermont, of me, of nutrition, of untapped? Anything that I can answer before we before we bid you farewell? What kind of beer is Rooted going to have for us at the finish line? Well, <laughs> our dear friends at Lawson's Finest Liquids will be providing a little sip and sip of sunshine, among others. Um, Literally the best. Outstanding. Shaxbury Cider, uh, also right down the road, started by a, a college friend of mine. Um, mm -hmm. They have some pretty awesome ciders. And uh, Topo Chico. I don't know if you're familiar with that awesome, highly mineraled uh, sparkling water from Texas. I think from Texas. We got some good hydration there. We got we got all the beverages. Wow. We got you covered. Um, Ted, how are you enjoying uh, mud season? Mud season's legit. Uh, yeah, it would yeah, be interesting to compare and contrast the different road maintenance techniques as they go across the border from from Vermont to Canada. Uh, I rode last Wednesday, and it, it was a, that was sort of the tail end of that dry spell we had. And then it got warm, it got cold, it snowed, it rained, and then I did the exact same three and a half hour route the other day. It's like northern Belgium after World War One, It's like unrideable, yeah. craters everywhere. It's Did so gnarly. Or were you like- That's what it's like here right now. It's just like, like I can't even drive down these roads. Yeah. Like my car yeah. is like getting stuck and I'm like <laughs> bottoming it out. Oh, yeah, I will admit it looks a little worse where you are because I've been seeing it. Yeah, oh man. And it's, I mean, it's funny. So where we are, we literally have more more gravel roads than paved. Yes, too. Yeah. They're so well maintained, except for this two week period. And then it's just, I mean, I feel so bad for the, the road maintenance crews because oh. you know they're going to grade it, then they're going to grade it, and then you're going to grade it. Until it like gets dry enough. 
Like, yeah. Exactly. They've been like dumping like rocks that are like this big into all the mud holes. Uh huh. Really bad ones. So like there's like little patches of just like super chunky gravel. Yeah. All over the roads, but kind of just sinks into the mud. Yeah. Then. And then you get like big helps. gravelly ruts. Out of, yeah. It is nuts. I was riding the other day. It's like riding on Velcro with your brakes on. I was flying down this hill and then I hit a slow section of, of mud and I'm be, like pedaling hard down probably a four or five percent grade. And then I hit the stone section where they've done the exact same thing, dropped in stones. I was going like VO2 max effort <laughs> to go across a short, flat section. It's amazing <laughs> how like, yeah, the, the resistance workout you get by riding this time of year. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, the rest of Canada like has mostly paved roads but for some reason quebec just does their own thing and it's all i think it's like where you are like it's mostly gravel and for whatever reason they're back to nature gravel. it's good it just means it means they don't have to pave it every five years like the rest of the country yeah, yeah. i'm not complaining no yeah, not at all definitely nice for gravel riding that's for sure exactly exactly well my dear friends i look forward to seeing you guys hopefully sooner than later yeah um Sleep's important, so I'm going to go let you get after it. Uh, thank you, Lindsay and Ryan, so much for your time. And where can we, as we sign off, where can our dear listeners find either of you on, say, the social medias? Probably Instagram. I am Ryan Atkins Diet on Instagram. And I'm Lindsay Dawn Webster. Yeah. Beautiful. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. We're keeping it under one hour. I love it. Um, that's all for now. Thank well, you very much for, for tuning in. Thanks, guys. <laughs>